house like a white tornado is what she said. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay. Yeah, that's, you know, that's, that's taking, spinning something around in a, in a way that's productive, even in the middle of whatever's happening to us. And, um, well, give me just a second. I know we're running a little bit late for those that are joining us this morning. Uh, make sure we just get a little bit crooked. Amen. You know, I just, I just, uh, um, we, you know, that we are representatives of Jesus Christ, and I like that word "represent" because really, what it means, if you break it down, is to represent. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We are representing Jesus, Amen. and so it's important that what we present is a represent representation of what Jesus would be in act actions and in, in words um, and all of that so I, I'm just I'm just you know as we were I've just so enjoyed the worship now as far as the the live worship I just think there's such a blessing there um, and uh, so we're just we're just thankful for that I'm just but I was just thinking you know Paul said you know I didn't come with you just in excellence of words but he said, I came with the power, the power and demonstration of the Spirit. Yeah. Um, and I believe the Spirit, the Holy Spirit wants to do, uh, wants to, to do things based upon the purity of the message of the gospel. I think if we can, the unity of the faith, really the unity of the faith is, 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 is the thing that is going, it's going to set up what I feel like is the, is the church Reemerges from this uh, shutdown, this worldwide shutdown. I believe if we can represent Jesus and we can get the gospel message correct, if we can get on the purity of the message. It's cross, the cross, and Jesus, and the cross only. If we can come into the unity of that, that's the unity of the Spirit, and that's the bond of peace. There is no peace in our lives apart from yeah. the unity of what the Spirit is saying that was accomplished through the cross of Jesus Christ. And so, but you know, I was thinking this morning. I, I was thinking back to our grandkids, and and uh, um, there, the, there's so many people, so many young people that that have not really uh, experienced uh, the tangible anointing and presence of the Holy Spirit in a way that causes them to be um, um, overshadowed to to the degree that everything else becomes obsolete in their. In, by comparison of that glory, and uh, so we're not we're not seeking the demonstration. We're seeking Jesus, and but we're, we're also I have a, I'm having a greater expect, expectation and desire. That's why today's message is actually uh, uh, labeled my passion because it's really Paul talking about his passion. But I think this is the passion of all of those of us who have tasted and seen that the Lord is good that have experienced the tangible anointing and, and presence of the Holy Spirit, mm-hmm. to, have, to have that be something that, are, that, are, that, that um, take, lays hold of our children and our grandchildren. I think mm-hmm. that is really the only thing that, that can really um, distract from the distractions, mm-hmm. can take away from the distractions of, of the world and the, and the the bells and whistles that are always going off all around us. Just so many things. We're so encumbered by distractions that I believe once, but once you, once the Holy Spirit grabs your attention in a way only He can. And I'm saying uh, not only with the anointing, which is the anointing is what God does, but also with the glory, which is who God is. You know, when people, uh, you know, uh, Moses wasn't satisfied with just seeing what God did. He wanted to see, he wanted to know him. He wanted to understand his, I want to see, he said, I want to see your glory. He'd seen miracles. He'd seen all this, the Red Sea and all this, but he said, I I still want to see your glory. And his glory is his goodness. um, And it's, but there's a tangibleness to it, to that glory that, that arrests us, arrests our hearts, arrests our attention, causes us to be still and know that he's God to where we understand where it captures us. And I just, you know, I was just, the, 
the, my desire is not only for all of us, you know, that have been there and done that, been in that situation, but I don't think there's anything else that can capture our kids and grandkids that, that, that yes. can cause uh, them to see in truth uh, a, bapt a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit and, and, a, and a, uh, the things that we, we have all experienced in times past and, and just, just a few weeks ago we experienced it here uh, during the praise and worship. And my passion is that uh, those things that the Holy Spirit would be free um, in light of the proper and the pure message of the cross to, to um, cause those things to happen in our midst to where our, our kids and grandkids and us, you know, I, we never can get too much of his glory. Amen. We can't ever get too much. Uh, and I want to start again this morning. Um, I wanted to kind of clarify in Hebrews chapter 12, Hebrews chapter 12, um, as the purity of the word is presented this morning, Lord, we just thank you for the Holy Spirit bearing witness to uh, the purity of the gospel, to the pure message of Jesus and his cross. Nothing added, uh, nothing taken away. The purity of what happened there in that, in that, uh, that place and time that was forever and since the beginning of time set in place uh, as a transition from uh, this fallen world to the to the to the new life that we have in Christ. And Lord, we just thank you for for bearing witness to the truth this morning. With what you whatever you want to do, Holy Spirit, you know what needs to be done in every heart, every life. You know that what our hearts, the passion of our hearts, and what we long for. Uh, in this relationship this is not about just knowing things it's about knowing someone knowing it's the who it's not the what and so lord thank you for that and thank you for this uh, message this morning in jesus name amen, amen. amen. yes amen. Uh, since you were just saying that it reminded me during two of the songs that y'all played today <clears throat> i think that based on what you were saying as well we kind of confirmed but when I was we were singing that this song opened eyes our spiritual eyes that we can see and I think more and more we're going to begin to see like visions that you know, we think oh visions you know, but we're going to see the Lord high and lifted up he said I saw him I saw him it wasn't just something I and even the second song um, Lord, unveil our eyes. Yes. I want to see you face to face. Yes. To see Jesus. Yeah. And Amen. that's, we're decreeing that for ourselves and our children. Amen. 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 That encounter mm -hmm. changes everything. It does. Yeah. The reality is the reality's present. You yes. know, we have the yes. fullness. In, yes. in, in Jesus dwelt the fullness <laughs> of the Godhead bodily, in bodily form. Mm -hmm. And in us that have that are born again, we we have the fullness of the Godhead in us, and, and yet there is a demonstration of that. Right. There is a, there is a realization of that, mm -hmm. and that comes with our eyes being further further uh, opened, and um, the Holy Spirit uh, uh, having our ears open to what the Holy Spirit is saying. Therefore, what He wants to do as a result of what He's saying in our lives. But yeah, I, I noticed that. It, isn't it, isn't it interesting when you when we sing these old songs? Yeah. I'm looking at those lyrics and I think I never saw those lyrics before, but because they're based upon the gospel. That they, when you when you see the gospel in them, it's like wow, these 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 old those, these old songs are powerful in the truth that's there. Amen. So uh, if if you would, um, we're going to finish up just a little. I want to give just a little clarification in Hebrews chapter twelve. Hebrews chapter twelve. Uh, that we have come to Mount Zion. I want to sit, want to make sure that we understand our position, just like Ann was talking about where we are right now. We are sitting in this room in our in our earthly suit, in our earth suits, but in, in our spirits we are we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. We are already there uh, in our spirit. We are already um, in a spiritual reality uh, that's called the new the, the Mount Zion or the New Jerusalem. We are, we are there. And so it says in verse 22, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God. We have, it's past tense, we have come. 
the heavenly Jerusalem to an innumerable company of angels. And this is where I want to show you the difference between what I used to understand about this in verse 23 uh, to what the, the New King James versus, versus the, the Passion, which is what all the scriptures on the notes in the notes today are the Passion translation. I forgot to put the TPT in there, but they're all out of the Passion translation. Uh, verse 23 in the King James says to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven to God the judge of all to the spirits of just men made perfect I always thought that to mean that it was the spirits of people that had passed on and that their, their spirits are, joined, are in heaven right now and so that's what I, that's what I interpreted that scripture to, to really say but look at the, look at the passion translation uh, first section of your notes today and as members of the church of the firstborn, all of our names have been legally registered as citizens of heaven. Isn't that a wonderful citizenship? Mm -hmm. And we have come before God who judges all. And how does he judge us? As Christ. Righteous as Christ. Yeah, he judges us as his son because he does, there's no difference, distinction between his son and us. Because his, we are in him and he is in us. Mm -hmm. So that's how, and when you see the word judging there, he's judging us that, that way. But look at the next part here and who lives among the spirits of the righteous who have been made perfect in his eyes. God's living amongst the, the spirit, all the spirits of those that, that are, they have been made perfect in his eyes. He's living among us right now. And he's still the God of wonder. He's a God of wonder. Uh, and I mean, he, he wants to demonstrate to us his glory. Uh, and I'm feeling it. I'm feeling it a little bit right now. He wants us. He wants to for us to experience uh, the fact, this reality of this. This is this is our this is our domain forever. Um, amen. And then he goes on to say that Jesus is a, is a and so uh, as the mediator of the new covenant, we are under a new covenant in which there's no separation. There's no uh, there's no judgment. We've passed from death to life, um, and this. And what I want to what I want to set up. There's two things we're going we're going to talk a little bit about in Philippians and a little bit about Colossians. There's two different things that say really pretty much the same, but I wanted to shed, uh, set up just a little bit about this adding to the cross. One more, just one more uh, little setup because I think it's so important for the unity of the faith. Um, and the bond of peace to cause the liberty of the spirit to be able to exist in our midst. It just we just read here where it's, it, it, he lives, God lives amongst among our spirit, the spirits of the righteous who have been made perfect in His eyes. He's living among us and in us, uh, and He wants to show Himself to us strong and also to the world around us in a way uh, that that demonstrates that truth. He wants to demonstrate that. Now, uh, as we get into Philippians, just as a little setup, I want to. I want This is going to be a weird verse to use here, but I'm sometimes doing weird verses. So, uh, in preaching the gospel, I'm going to preach a little bit of the gospel in Numbers again. Last time we talked about the when, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Remember, mm -hmm. the serpent. It was a bronze serpent. It was a a, a, a judgment. Uh, it was an illustration of the judgment of God against. Uh, the sin of, of, of all the people and Jesus said in John 3 14 that as the Moses lifted up the serpent so must the son of man be lifted up and the one thing that they were required to do was to look to, to that to that cross that Moses lifted up mm -hmm. and that's the one requirement we have to look to the cross that's the one thing uh, that causes uh, everything else to be changed in our life there's nothing else that we can add to that. But I want you to see here uh, how the, I put in your notes there the words prophetic, prophetic shadow. Prophetic shadow. The, the Old Testament is a shadow of which Christ became the substance. Everybody, everybody see, the, see how that transition goes? Yes. It's an, it's an illustration. The Old Testament was an illustration. So in Numbers chapter 15, uh, uh, starting with verse 32, I believe is right. Yeah. Now, while the children of Israel were, were in the wilderness, they found a man gathering sticks on the Sabbath day. Now, the Sabbath day, day under the law was, was something you, de you didn't deviate from. You didn't do work on the Sabbath. Now, for the, uh, that's a shadow. Now, the substance is, who is our Sabbath rest? Jesus. Jesus is our Sabbath rest. 
So it's it's equally from a standpoint of from the going from a from the shadow to the substance to realize that we can't add anything to that rest. We can't add anything. We can't add any work to His work. All we can do is rest in His work. And this is what this is all about. I used to read these stories and I think yeah, well, this is these are strange stories here. But now I see it in light of the truth. And so I think it's so important for us to see the spiritual side of this. Uh, it says, uh, um, And those who found him gathering sticks brought him to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation. They put him under guard because it, it had not been explained what should be done to him. Then the Lord said to Moses, The man must surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones outside the camp. Uh, so the Lord commanded Moses, all the congregation brought him out. So under, under the law, if you were under the law, any deviation from the Sabbath rest, what you did on the Sabbath was, was uh, quickly, uh, you know, in this case, the man was, was stoned to death. Uh, and that seems awful. It seems terrible. Uh, but that was what, that's what life under the law is. It's terrible. Yeah. It's a horrible, it was a horrible existence, and I thank God that Jesus became a curse for us so that we're no longer under the curse of the law. But I want you to see the spiritual application of this. And our spirit, the spiritual truth of the gospel is, is that death begins to re-enter our lives when we when we are picking up sticks spiritually. When we're doing when we start doing work to try to add to what Christ has finished. I don't care what it is, whether it's fasting, whether it's praying, whether it's whatever it is, you can fast, but don't fast uh, to, 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 for it to be the reason you get something from God. You can fast to have your heart settled and separated so you can hear more clearly, but it's not the reason for an anointing in your life. It's not the reason for the glory in your life. There's nothing you can add that can increase the potential for God to give you, to demonstrate everything in your life that was paid for at the cross. And I'm so adamant about that because it's so important for us to realize that otherwise we disqualify ourselves continually or we qualify ourselves continually. We're constantly trying to qualify. And why do we do that? Mainly because we, we, we kind of wonder, well, why am I not seeing this in my life? Well, there's got to be a reason. So maybe I'm going to find out. Maybe it's because I'm not praying enough. Maybe it's not I'm not reading my Bible enough. Or maybe I'm just not looking at the cross with the eyes of my understanding being open, like, like Anne was saying, to where the reality of, that everything happened there, the perfect rest that gives us everything happened there. And I think it's so important for us to see that. Now let's add to that and look at, look at Acts chapter 3 for just a minute. I'm trying to give you a, a prophetic shadow of the reality of the new covenant, the rest that we cannot afford in our lives to, to let the enemy think that, we are, that he can have anything to do with us. That the enemy can have any any uh, any sway in our life in any, for anything. Amen. Amen. All, all because of the reality of the cross. The reality. <laughs> I'm just just we'll just wait till you see some of this stuff here. But uh, Acts chapter three, Acts chapter three. Um, and I believe we're coming into a season that the purity of the message of the cross. Mm. is going to come in line with, with what the, has been foretold prophetically from, from the beginning of, the, of, of time of what, um, that, that he's saving the best wine for last. And there's going to be something that, that, that aligns itself with the purity of the message when the body of Christ comes into the fullness of this um, understanding. There's going, to be some, there's going to be some things that can happen that can't happen now because somebody's going to take credit for it. Somebody's going to think, well, it was my anointing that made this happen. So there's nothing. He's not. I, I don't think that. I don't think God, the Holy Spirit's going to allow anything until it's purely because of Jesus. Amen. Purely, Amen. in the worst of us or in the best of us, Amen. it's not going to be about us. And when the church finally wakes up to that, when we finally wake up to that, there's no telling. There's no limit to what can happen. But we limit it by thinking we can make a difference in what happens. I mean, you see what, where we're going with this? Okay, Acts chapter 3. I'm just laying three little, three, three little uh, uh, things here. Chapter 12, 
right after the, when the early church started started off, um, Peter and James they went they were uh, Peter and John went to pray to the temple uh, at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. Um, was that six o'clock? What is what is night? Is that is that three in the afternoon maybe or something? But, um, at, at the gate, beautiful. We have um, we have access by Jesus' uh, torn flesh into the holy of holies now. But they, there was a man there that had been sitting there that was uh, um, um, someone that was uh, lame from from his mother's womb, and um, so they they Peter and James Peter and John came walking up, and he, the guy fixed his eyes on him and says, uh, and John, Peter and John looked said, look at us, look at us, because we we represent we repre we represent Jesus. We're going to, I'm going to represent him right now. We're going to represent Jesus to you. So look at us. We don't have silver and gold. It's not about what we can buy or what we can give you in, in terms of this realm. But what we do have, you, what we do have, we're going to give in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and all, he got up and he was leaping and he walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping and praising God. You ever sing that old song, that old hymn, walking and leaping and praising God? Yeah. Uh, and all the people saw him walking and praising God, and then they, they all came running up. They wanted to know what happened. <laughs> and to one, they were filled with wonder and amazement. But look at verse 11. Look at what Peter says. Now, as the lame man stood uh, and his heel held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in Solomon's porch. So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Why, why are you marveling? We're just representing Jesus. Uh, but look what this look this look what he says next here. Our wives look so intently at us as it is through our own power or godliness we had made this man walk. Now I know that there's a lot of people, there's a lot of things going on, have been going on in the churches that where people are taking the 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 the, the ability of power to happen as a part of their anointing. That you know, I have developed this anointing in my life and this is gonna happen in my ministry. As long as that's going on, there's not going to be much going on. I mean, I can promise you that because he's, God's not going to let anybody, anything get glory except Jesus and his finished work at the cross. That's all that he's going to, that, that's all he's going to magnify. And so if we're still adding or taking away, but I love what Peter says there. It's not, my, it's not our power. It's, it, we're representing the power of God in us. And it's not because we're, we're because of our personal holiness, not because we're goody two shoes and we've kept all the rules and we live right and done right and all that. It's simply because of one thing, and that's because Jesus paid for it. He paid for this man to be healed. Amen. Mm -hmm. And so they just walked in that truth. Now the last the last one, Galatians chapter five. Galatians chapter five. Anybody have the Passion translation handy? Of Galatians chapter five, verse uh, eight. Now, verse. In fact, I'm sorry. I've got the wrong verse. There it should be verse nine. Um, Five, nine. Let, yeah, but let me let me open it up with the the New King James says, "You ran well." Verse seven. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? What does it mean to obey the truth? To simply believe. Yes, Rhonda. That's it. To simply believe, not to do, but to believe in what was done. Who hindered you? You were you were doing. You were on the right track. And here, what, what happened? Well, some of these people came along and said, well, you we need to add this, you need to take away that, you need to do this, you need to do that, and then God will do stuff. Uh, this persuasion does not come from him who calls you. You're not, that, that's not God's persuasion. That's man's persuasion. And what it does is it limits God. It doesn't empower God to do anything. It takes it away. Y'all with me? Because he says a little leaven leavens the whole lump. What does that verse say in the, the, the passage? For nine or eight and nine? Uh, uh, nine. Don't you know that when you allow even a little light into your heart, it can permeate your entire belief system? So, so let me, let me so say that again a few words at a time. Don't you know? Don't you know? That when you allow. That when you allow. Even a little lie into your heart. Even a little lie into your heart. It can permeate. It can permeate. Your entire belief system. Your entire belief system. Mm -hmm. 
read verse 8 before that? Yeah, because that's... It, says, it, it, goes, it, it says this, The one who enfolded you into his grace is not behind this false teaching that you've embraced. Not at all. Read, yeah, read verse 8. I don't know if you could hear uh, Deborah um, or Tina, but read verse 8 and 9. But I I think it's... Isn't that, isn't that, isn't that powerful? Yeah. And the, the one is capitalized. The one is capitalized. That's the Passion Translation. If you get a chance, look at that in the Passion Translation. Because that's the, that, little, that little lie that you can do something or not do something to change the outcome of what he wants to do through what Jesus finished, that little lie can permeate and, and destroy your whole belief system. Everybody see that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The purity, the purity of the message. Mm -hmm. Verse eight and verse eight and nine, especially in that. Uh, read what's verse eight. Um, say again. Verse uh, eight says. I'll read one, it a few words at a time. The one who enfolded you into his grace. The one that it, the one that enfolded you into his grace. Is not behind this false teaching. Is not is grace. not behind this false teaching. Of adding something to the cross that you've embraced, that you have embraced, the not Galatians, at the, not at all, <laughs> not at all, <laughs> not a nine. Absolutely, and all means all. And all, <laughs> the Greek for word for all is all. So he's not behind any of that. In fact, it's defiling. That little, that one little lie can permeate your home, your whole belief system, and negate the completeness yeah. of the cross. Just like you see the illustration with the man with the sticks. Mm -hmm. See, that, that's how serious the Sabbath was in the shadow. Mm -hmm. The Sabbath is, is serious in, this, in, in the substance of Christ as well because it can take away our rest. Mm -hmm. It can take away the Sabbath rest we have in Christ where every, anything is possible and everything is probable. Y'all with me? I know. I'm, am I teaching a little different today? Yeah, it's good. Am I preaching a little different today? Uh, I'm sorry, but I'm just. I'm just. I have. Sorry. Well, I'm. I'm sorry that I haven't seen. I haven't said this earlier. Sooner. Maybe that's a better way to say it. Philippians. Philippians chapter three. Philippians chapter three. We're going to talk a little bit about Philippians and Colossians, and the reason I want to bring these two things up is because they say the same thing, in a way that that. Can, if you can see if you can see this distinction, I hope you have your notes because the notes are in the Passion Translation. Uh, and I have several verses that are split up. I'm just going to say them. If you have the notes, you, you see how it, it, uh, um, it is laid out there. Uh, we are those, Philippians 3.3, 3, we are those who boast. You know, it's okay to boast. <clears throat> but not about your anointing or your power or your spiritual in endeavors or what you have to offer people. It's okay to boast if you're, you know, if you, if you, you know, you've got, you know, you understand principles and you're, I mean, you're, you're living, you're, you know, you like your, what you've, what you've done as far as something in your life that's, you know, God's blessed you. It's okay to boast in, but don't, it says we are not those who boast in what Jesus has done. We are those who boast in, in what Jesus has done and not in what we can accomplish in our own strength. So that's why Paul, Paul could say, I boast in my weakness because when I, when I boast in my weakness, I know it's not me anymore. It's his strength that comes in and takes over. Uh, he said, I used to boast in everything I was. Now it's all a cow, but pile of cow manure yeah. based on the excellency of what, now, what I know to be true. Well, worthless. Worthless. It's worthless. It's worthless. Now this is where the title of the message came in and starting with verse 9 my passion he said my passion and that's my this is my passion it's, it's our passion uh, all of us have this same passion the reason i know that is because we all want to know and understand the purity of the message of the cross we all want to know more completely and fully to have our eyes open to have the realization enlightened in our hearts the reality of this just how complete this work was was finished just how complete it was finished my passion is to be consumed with him and not clinging to my own righteousness based upon, based in keeping the written law. My righteousness will be his based on the faithfulness of Jesus Christ, the very righteousness that comes from God. And I continually long to know the wonders of Jesus more fully 
and to experience the overflowing power of his resurrection working in me. Now, this is the part I want you to really pay attention. This is what I want you to really pay attention to. I will be one with him in his sufferings, and I will be one with him in his death. Anybody got that? See, his death, his sufferings were for me. I'm not suffering for me anymore. He suffered for me. So I get the, I get the benefit of what he suffered. Uh, and then it says, um, and I will be one with him in his death. His death was my death. The old man, Eric, the old person that was born from the first Adam, now, because when Jesus came from the came forth from the dead, but when he died, that's where my death is. In my in my uh, understanding of the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, that's where I came to an end. Everything in my life came to an end when his life came to an end in the first Adam, being born of this this realm, this world. Amen. Everybody with me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Only then, I've got it. I've got it underlined. I've got it in bold. Everybody see that? Yeah. Only then, only then. So until I come to the end of me, I can't come to the beginning and fullness of Him. You see that? Yeah. And believe me, that's that's a process that we're that many of us are still because of the way we were taught. We're still in that process. Only then will I be able to experience, everybody say experience. Experience. Complete oneness. You know, there's an experience to that complete oneness that we have in Christ. There's an experience there. It's a it's a it's written, it's the word, it's truth, but there is an experience to it. That oneness, there's there's a glory to that that oneness that we have. And that's what Paul was passionate about. And that's what he was longing for. His longing was for that. Um to experience the overflowing power of his resurrection working in me. So now after I come to the end of myself, now it's now whose resurrection is it life is it is doing the work. Yes. It's his resurrection life. You see that? Mm -hmm. it, I, it, it's only by my end that I can enjoy his beginning and, and eternal in his that eternal reality of that truth from that point on. Everybody see that? Uh, <clears throat> from the realm of death that only, that only then will I be able to experience complete oneness with him uh, in his death only then will I be able to, from his resurrection from the realm of death but we are a colony of heaven on earth as we cling to our cling tightly to our life giver the Lord Jesus Christ who will transform uh, our humble bodies and transfigure us into the identical likeness of his glorified body. So not, not only do we have this, this fullness in, in our spirit man today, the fullness of him dwells in us. Of his fullness we have all received, grace upon grace upon grace. Uh, but he's, he's told us now he will continue, continue to transfigure us into the same likeness of his body. And usually in using his matchless power, everybody say his matchless power. His, his matchless power. power. Not my power. He continually subdues everything to himself. And then verse chapter four, verse one says, Now arise in the fullness of your union with the Lord. So he wants us to arise to that fullness. Uh, it's not a it's not a it's not a measure, it's it's all of it. <laughs> that union. You, you, we have the, the fullness of that union is, is really indescribable. It's an indescribable reality. And Paul wanted, his passion was to, to know, to be consumed with him and to know that, to experience that union. And, and I, you know, I long for that. I long for that for me. I long for that for our church. I long for that for all of us. And I long for that for my, you know, our grand, you know, granddaughter sitting over there, our grand, grandkids uh, to, to, to understand that. <coughs> This is not just some uh, cunningly devised fable. This is real. And he wants to make it real to us individually and corporately, doesn't he? That's his desire. And what happens, what gets in the way? The only thing that can get in the way is when we're adding in our life, we get disillusioned. What, is that, what does that mean? 
the, we lose the illusion, we, we get into an illusion of what's not right, and we lose the, the reality of what, what is real, what is genuine, what is pure, what is true. Um, and so Paul is, Paul is talking so passionately about this, and, I'm, and I'm, this week I've been reading Philippians and Colossians over and over again, uh, and, and, I, and I believe I'm, I'm seeing a little bit more of the, the way he understood this. Um, and the way he's trying to relate it to us. Everybody, everybody with me on this? Mm -hmm. Now, Colossians, let's go to Colossians now because he's going to say the same thing a little different way. Colossians chapter 2, verse 3 says, in the Passion Translation, Colossians chapter 2, verse 3, says, for our spiritual wealth is in him. like hidden treasure waiting to be discovered. Heaven's wisdom and endless riches of revelation knowledge. Heaven's wisdom. See, it's, this is heaven. This is wisdom from above. This is not wisdom from this. Down here, the wisdom is it's about us and what we're doing and what we're not doing. And if we can add a little bit of this earthly wisdom to the spiritual wisdom from above, then maybe we can enhance things happening that maybe aren't happening. I mean, it, or, or, is, am I just by myself or sometimes there are temptations for that? Mm -hmm. Well, maybe I'm just going to get serious with God. Anybody ever heard that said or said that maybe to yourself? I, it's time for me to get serious about God. No, it's not. It's time for us to get serious about understanding the cross, the completion of that cross, because that's where, that's where wisdom from above starts and that's where wisdom from here ends is when it's all about what he's done, what all he's accomplished, and the will, the spiritual wealth that's in him that we have access to now. Isn't this beautiful? It's a, tre it's a hidden treasure. And he wants us, he, he's, he wants us to be uh, to, long, to, uh, to long for and have the passion for, for uh, discovering this, these endless riches. So look at that, it says, endless riches of revelation knowledge. You, you, we can't, it, it's, it's forever, an ongoing uh, joyful encounter. Um, for he is the complete fullness of deity living in human form. And our own completeness is now found in him. We are completely filled with God as Christ's fullness overflows within us. He is the head of every kingdom and authority in the universe. Now look at this. Through our union with him, we have experienced circumcision of, of, the, of heart, of the heart. Now, let, let, the, let the Holy Spirit, there's something the Holy Spirit wants to do in this passage, passage right here. He wants to do something in our... All of the guilt, all of the guilt and power of sin has been cut away and is now extinct because uh, of... of because of what Christ, the anointed one, has accomplished for himself. Is that what it says? Mm -hmm. It says it, it, he accomplished it for us. Amen? All the guilt. What's the Greek word for all again? All. All, all the guilt and power of sin has been cut away. That's the circumcision of the, of the heart. He's cut, it, he's cut it out of our life and made it extinct. It's now extinct because of what he's done, what he accomplished for us, as us. For we've been, now here, here we come to this, this, this is what I want you to see, the correlation between our end and his beginning. If we don't get this, if we don't really, if we're not really understanding this transition, it'll cause us to vacillate back and forth in it. Everybody see, now look, look at this again. Uh, We've been buried with him into his death. Our baptism into death also means that we are raised with him from death's... Let's see, I'm sorry, I've got... Uh, it, for we've been buried with him into his death. Our baptism into death also means that we were raised with him. Uh, when we believed in God's resurrection power, the power that raised him from death's realm, this realm of death describes our former state. That's, where, this, that's who we used to be. That's where we used to be. That was our old reality, but it's not our reality anymore. Um, 
Uh, this realm of death describes our former state, for we were held in sin's grasp. The law of sin and death held us, had us captive. And the only future we had to look forward to was death because of that, because of Adam's sin. But now, everybody say, but now. now. We've been resurrected out of that realm of death. Never to return. For we are forever alive and forgiven of all our sins. We are forever alive and forgiven of all our sins. Now, how many of our sins were future sins when Jesus died on the cross? All of them. So this isn't, don't believe, somebody's going to come and tell you, well, that's, he's going to forgive you of your past sins, but not your future sins, because see, now you know. No, all of them were future in our lives. Now look, you know, we're in. There's a term going around right now called cancel culture. Yeah. If if the if the body of Christ knew this and can convey this to the world, this is the cancel culture that would would cause heart deliverance for everybody, starting with the church and all the church. When we represent this to the up to the world, it'll change them as well, in a way that really makes it makes is a, is a reality. He canceled out every legal violation we had on our record and the old arrest warrant that stood to indict us, the indict us that, that was the law he erased it all our sins and look at this it's not just our sins but our stained soul we live in a body we have a soul and we are a spirit amen and we're a born again spirit he deleted it all, and they cannot be retrieved. <laughs> Anybody ever had that happen in the computer where yeah. it gets deleted and it's unretrievable? That's where we are. It cannot be retrieved. It cannot ever be held against us, ever. Um, so that stained soul, and I like the way Paul puts the word stained on that, because, see, the soul realm is the hardest part of our life to allow the completeness of the gospel to work. Because we see, everybody try to get a stain out of something, a sink or a clothes mm -hmm. or whatever. We can just work at it, work at it, work at it. You know, he wants us to understand that that stain, is, it's a, it, this is the universal stain remover. He deleted it all and they cannot be retrieved. Everything we once were in Adam has been placed onto his cross and nailed permanently there is a public display of cancellation. This is the cancel culture that we all need to embrace. Yeah. Isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah. I mean, but really, I mean, the reason there's false cancel cultures out there is because they don't know the true one. Yeah. The true one changes everything. It'll change us. It'll change them. But God, let God let it start. Let it begin in us as the church because we represent Jesus to the world. Mm -hmm. uh, then Jesus made a public spectacle of all the powers and principalities of darkness, stripping away from them every weapon and all their spiritual authority and power to accuse us. It's like the woman that was caught in adultery. What was the first thing he did? He silenced her accusers. Yeah. And that's what the gospel does. It silences the accuser. The accuser of the brethren. Silent. He silenced them because there's nothing. There's nothing for them. There's nothing for them left for them to accuse us of. Uh, and by the power of the cross, Jesus led them. Around. I love the. I love the illustration of this. I can see this happening. Jesus led them around as prisoners uh, in a procession of triumph. He was not their prisoner. <laughs> they were his. Suddenly, it was, you know, like Astro and the Jetsons. Rut row. Uh, what just happened? Everything just happened. What just changed? Everything changed. All the, all the accusation, all the, the guilt, all the shame, all the, all the things that come against us were made extinct, canceled, and erased. Deleted. I've got all four. I've got those four words yeah. highlighted in, bo in bold and, and underlined. Extinct canceled, erased, deleted. Amen? Mm -hmm. uh, and he is not their prisoner. 
He was not their prisoner. They were his. And he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Amen? Amen. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. Uh, Christ's resurrection is your resurrection too. Your crucifixion with Christ has severed the tie to this life. And now you trade now and now your true life is hidden away in God in Christ. And as Christ himself is seen for who this this is what some who somebody said this some, somebody talked about this just a little bit ago. I think it was Deborah maybe that said and and as Christ himself is seen for who he really is who you really are will also be revealed. As we see him for who he is, we'll see us for who we are. For you are now what? With him. One with him in his glory. You're one with him. You're one spirit with him. You're indeparable. Uh, amen. So I just felt like I just felt like this morning um, that he wants to. He wants us to. I mean, I don't like. I mean, sometimes the illustration is drawing a line, a line in the sand. Uh, it, you know, it, you know, has some connotations I don't like. But there is, with regard to the transition of the cross, that's the ultimate line in the sand. Uh, and if we can, if we can get to a point, both of these are illustrating the same thing. It's it's in it's embrace it's in embrace in embracing the completeness of our demise or our death as who we were is the segue, the only segue, the only, only then it says that we'll be able to experience that complete oneness with him uh, in his resurrection from the realm of death. So resurrection, his resurrection works only when we have finished the process of our death. Amen? Is that good news? Yes. And I'm saying this with, with, with an urgency in a sense that I feel like that that um, what's happening in in the earth, what's happening in the body of Christ right now, is it is this this transition is is lining up, uh, and I believe the church is going to reemerge in the unity of the Spirit. Amen. The unity of this is the unity of the Spirit. This message is what unleashes an unprecedented ability of the of the Holy Spirit to do what He wants to do, as long as nobody's trying to get the credit for it. Is that is do y'all do y'all do y'all relate to what I'm saying? Yes. I, I want to see. I want to see. I want to see. Uh, I want to experience it. You know, there's churches. I mean, most most of the churches today are trying to find a way to adapt to um, what we just read um, in Galatians chapter five, verse eight. We're trying to adapt to the to that process that 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 church um, history church experience church uh, um, has been for 1800 years we've been adding to uh, what is the pureness of the gospel that was working for the first 200 years um, and all it was doing was adding precepts and adding rules adding rituals adding religion adding things um, and I believe that that he wants to cut those away he wants to cut those away from our hearts. He wants to cut those away from his church. He wants to he wants to reemerge. He wants the church to reemerge in this time in a way that's really may not have honestly may not have been even been possible. That's where you have to look at every evil thing, every evil intention is a potential for a good outcome, because we have been shut down as a church that's been meeting uh, for by and large for a long time. And so being in a place where we can be silenced in our, uh, you know, trying to make something happen. And I think a lot of what goes on in churches is that we, we get a little taste of an anointing or get a little taste of something. We try to figure out how to make that work. That's why even with what happened here a few weeks ago, we can try to say, okay, you know, Tina and Paul, Briscoe, let's play those same songs and let's play them in this same order. Mm -hmm. And let's start at the same time, and then we're going to have the same thing happen. See, we, we're 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 trying to make it happen. We're trying to figure out how to happen instead of just like like Jesus said. That all, you, all your part is to look at the cross, look at your end, and look at what happened as a result in your in the beginning, His life beginning in us.
performance of that. I get an amen. <laughs> it's, the whole the whole place has been shaken. Yeah, it's like the prison Paul and Silas were in. Amen. Yes, he did. Uh, now let's go ahead and let's go ahead and take communion together here. I want you to. Uh, I, I was going to go on a little bit with something that, that it's in the next pa passage of Colossians. Um, and we may do it next week, or we may just you know let you. I, I would. I would. Uh, there's a there's a passage in the in the Passion Translation of Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 through 11. And it's called, the title of that is New Creation Life. New Creation Life. Thank you, son. Now, in the Old Testament, the law just said, don't do this, do this, don't do this, do this, do this, don't do this, don't do that. Do this and you'll die. Do this and you'll live. Don't do this, don't do that. But under the new covenant, thank you, Tom. Yes, sir. He he starts out with verse five, saying, "Live as one who died." <laughs> That's the way he starts it out. He's not saying, "Now don't do this or don't do that." He said, "Now live as one who died." In other words, now you're living as him in you. It's his resurrection life in you. It's not you trying to change you who you are or what you're doing by who, what you do and what you don't do. Um, and he talks about um, sexual sin and impurity. He said, live as, and he goes through the whole list here. He says, live as one who died to diseases. <laughs> wow. Live, live as one who died to diseases. You know what? That's in the Aramaic and it's in the Passion Translation because in the older manuscripts, were, which were the Aramaic languages, when they translated it into Greek, they, they, they omitted that, that phrase. And so I like that. I like the old. The older is better in some yeah. cases, right? But I like that. Live, live as one who died to diseases. Now, does that mean, okay... It says it starts out, and I like this. Look, live as one who's died in every form of sexual sin and impurity. Uh, live as one, uh, you know, the desire for wealth, all these things. Live as one who who, does, who died to that. Does that mean that we're per perfect? No, we're perfect in our heart. We're perfect in our life in Him. But th does that mean when you when you have a disease that you're well, you know, you're just failing? No, it just He's just saying, live as one who died to that. And I want to use an illustration as we take communion this morning. You know, when the, sh the shadow, uh, which was the old, the old Testament, and the children of Israel, when they came out of Egypt, it's an illustration of the church coming out of the world. We came out of the world the same way they came out of Egypt. And it's a wilderness in which we were encountering Mount, uh, of Sinai, Mount Sinai, a law that he wanted us to see and and not embrace, but to say, we can't do that because he wanted us to go in and enter the promised lands. But notice what happened when they left Egypt, what happened to, what, to, their, to the, their physical issues. Right after they ate Passover, that right after they covered the blood, covered the house, the door, the doorpost with their, the, blood of, the blood of the lamb, <laughs> the blood of the lamb, right? It was a lamb. Yeah. Yeah. And they ate it the body of Christ, they ate it, they ate it all. They came out. Was there anything they did? Was it because, okay, now God was going to single out, okay, they did not They did this and they didn't do that. So some of them are going to live through this and some of them aren't. No, it was all of them. And there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a substance in Christ that speaks uh, out of that shadow. Amen. And that's healthy. That's what I mean. Every, every yeah, that's amazing. There wasn't even any feeble left. In there. You know, feebleness was gone. And they were made whole. And yeah, the blood, the blood, and it was not even. It was just on the doorpost. They couldn't. Now we're getting to put it inside of us. We're putting. We're drinking the blood into us. It's not. It's not just spreading it on a door, on the outside. And now it's on the inside. <laughs> yes. There's you know a saying. I know y'all all heard this, but there's a saying that live life to the fullest. That's what we should be doing in Christ. We should be not not the world term, 
you know, yeah. regardless of what's going on or whatever, we should be living life as to, you know, everything changed when Jesus died. Well, you know, when we accepted that. You know what sounded, what came out, what I thought came out of your mouth when you said that was, let's live death to the fullest. <laughs> let's oh, live, oh, right. Let's exactly. live, let's live, live his death. death to the fullness. Exactly. The fullest. Yeah. Yeah. And again, there's no, is there any, did, did, did all of what, Je, what Jesus did remove any guilt, any shame, any condemnation, all of that accusation, all of that? Is it because, I mean, are we, are, should we still try to embrace it in spite of the fact that sometimes it's, there, there may not be successes in our life? I mean, are we perfect in any other way? No. In our, 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 uh, our actions at, at times, are we 100% accurate? The, the, only one, the only one thing that counts, though, is his actions were perfect. And it gets credited to our account. His perfectness gets accredited to our account. Amen? So I just, I, this, this verse just kind of just kind of popped, you know, when I saw it. And then I looked at the research on it and said this was in the Aramaic, but not in the Greek. It is, um, live is one who died to diseases. Well, did we die to disease? Where did we die to diseases? In, in Matthew chapter 8, I believe it's verse 17, it says, He himself took our infirmities and carried our diseases. He put them, he put them in his body and went to, and died with them on his body. And so uh, I just want to, I, I want to live because I'm living now his life. I'm living in him, his resurrection. I just want to live as one, as one who's died to these things. I'm not trying to put them to death anymore. I'm just trying to live. Uh, according to what Paul says, everything he says here is to live as one who died. We died in Christ with him. We rose at, it, it, with Christ as, as he rose. We rose from the dead. And our life is forever in him. Him. So, Lord, we thank you for you that you were the Passover. Paul said that in 1 Corinthians 6, and I think he is, that he is, Jesus is our Passover lamb. He was, he was, um, he took our infirmities, carried our diseases, and then he took our sins, and with his own blood, he paid for all of them. Uh, through his death, they've all been, and I quote again, become extinct, canceled, erased, deleted, and deleted. Amen. Everything, Amen. all of it, all of that, all separation has been removed. There's nothing that separates us from his love, and that's the only thing that's left. When it's all said and done, is his love for us is indescribable and eternal uh, and, and perfect. And so, Lord, we embrace that truth this morning. We thank you for what, what Jesus, as our Passover lamb, did, as you showed us in the illustration uh, of what was in the, in the, the um, um, prophetic shadow. Jesus, you became the substance of all those shadows in the Old Testament. You're the substance of it. You're the reason it happened then. And you're the reason it happens now. And so, Lord, we thank you for your body. And as we partake of that, we're not gonna, I'm not going to leave a little fragment. I'm not going to pinch off a fragment and, and eat the rest of it. Just like you told them, don't leave one morsel of that lamb. Amen. Don't, don't, don't leave any of it on the table. And, Lord, we don't want to leave anything on the table that you prepared for us in the presence of our enemies. Right in the middle of the mess of our enemies, you prepared this table. And we don't, leave, we, wouldn't, we don't want to leave one morsel of that lamb on the table. We want to ingest it all. He, Jesus said, it, you, you said, Lord, if we eat your flesh and drink your blood, then we have your life in us. And so, Lord, we thank you for your body. We're going to live as one who died to diseases because of what you did with our diseases and with death itself in Jesus name Amen. Amen. Lord thank you for your blood the blood of the new covenant that gives us a perfect union because this covenant Lord was between you and your dad you're, you're, you're between God the father and God the son and as a man you came to the earth so as man you could represent man and we could have this mystery uh, revealed to us that it was you taking our place. You became a man because we had to have a man to redeem us. We thank you for your blood that has removed all our guilty stains and has made us alive and new and perfect in you. And your, our union with you is perfected 
and this is a symbol of it. Forever your blood is settled on the mercy seat in heaven. You shed, you put your blood on that mercy seat in heaven. And it forever speaks to our righteousness now. It forever speaks to our forgiveness. It forever speaks to our union with our Father now in heaven. In Jesus' name. So Paul, Paul said that, you know, he said, I want to, I, I'm, I'm concerned not because I, I don't want you to leave the simplicity. See, when we try to, when we, when we try to, when it, the, the gospel is so simple. It's just all about him. And when it gets complicated is when we add us back in the equation. So I think the Holy Spirit wants to confirm in our hearts and our lives the simplicity of the message and for us to, to embrace that and live as if, live, live as one who has died. We have died with Christ. And just to let that expression be in us. And, and Lord, you know, we just, we, just thank, uh, uh, we just thank the Lord for revealing this to us and causing us to, and again, there, you know, there's things that we don't understand about what's not happening or what, but I know that the, the, what Paul was adamantly writing about was that anything that's going to change it in a good way is going to, become, is going to be because of uh, the truth being uh, revealed. And all those, like in the book of uh, the, the, the faith chapter of Hebrews chapter 12, 11 and 12, all of those that have, have died in faith are all part of the cloud of witnesses. And every one of them now, every person that has gone on would tell us, hey, Keep fighting the good fight of faith. Amen. Faith is about Him; it's not about us. Amen. And He wants the, the Lord. He want, I want the Lord to perfect our faith. I want Him to so that we can go into a life of dominion. So there is no condemn, condemnation. We can't feel guilty when we have failures because still the source of our winning is not us. The source of our any failure in our life to receive is not because of us. It's because of confusion that the enemy wants us to not embrace the truth of what really is real and what is true and like john said then we know that he is true and in him is the perfect uh, revelation of that truth so lord we thank you for that and we, we thank you for the people and the healing the healing of the of, of those that live as, as, as those that have died to diseases and it says died, died to desires for forbidden things which is magic match something magical to make it happen that's what we're looking for including the desire for wealth Lord, you're the wealth. You're our wealth. Yeah, you're, you're, the, you're the riches, the only riches that matter in this life and in the ages to come. And so thank you. We, we love you all. Um, and we we'll, we'll look forward to seeing you next week. God bless you all. Amen. Amen.